Okay. Welcome everybody. I hope the um, online can hear me. Uh, we're very lucky to start today's lecture with the guest lecture from Jackie Poon. Uh, just a few words about him. Jackie is the current chair of the Young Data Analytics Working Group, the head of finance at NIB Travel, the, the travel insurance division of NIB Health Fund. He is an editor of the monthly data analytics newsletter for actuaries, Institute members. And he's also a member of the IFOA Machine Learning Reserving Working Party, has a keen interest in research on the use of data analytics and machine learning techniques to complement the traditional actuarial skill set in insurance. So the question uh, that we're going to try to answer today is how are neural network models used uh, within uh, the industry? I work in GI, so I'll focus on that. I'll talk about uh, what models are being used currently uh, aside from neural networks and also some opportunities because uh, neural networks are relatively new to the industry and we're still exploring in many ways um, how things are used. And um, as always, it's good to start off with something lighthearted. So here we've got expectation. Perhaps people might be expecting, hey, we've got some deep learning stuff going on and uh, it's all very fancy and advanced. But reality is, uh, well, you can't go wrong with XKCD. Often uh, it is just a bit of a muddling through and trying to find uh, insights out of it by pouring the data into a big pile of linear algebra and stirring the pile until things start looking right. I'll run through a few different applications in turn. Uh, the first thing I'll talk about is technical pricing. And the technical pricing problem is this. We've got a bunch of rating factors uh, that we collect uh, when someone does a quote. So if someone goes to our website, they're like, I want to have a motor insurance policy or a travel insurance policy. They put in the details and the price comes out. That price behind the scenes is based on an estimate of the claims risk for that risk profile. So if you're a younger driver, you tend to be uh, more likely to have a crash. Uh, if you're an older driver, you tend to be less likely. If you live in certain areas, your car is more likely to be stolen. You might be uh, susceptible to hail risk, depending on where you are in Australia. Things like that, that all goes into technical pricing. And within the industry at the moment, the most popular models are the GLM and the GBM. So one approach would be to just use a GLM and just stick with that. That's traditional way of doing things and still quite popular in a lot of companies. GBMs are starting to get uh, used a bit more now. And there's a few ways that people have used it. One would be like a challenger model approach. The idea is that you think you have a GLM that's pretty good. Uh, but you, what you'll do is you'll you, uh, fit a GBM, get performance metrics against it, and um, benchmark that to your GLM. Or rather the other way around, the GLM gets benchmarked to the GBM. And you'll manually tweak your GLM until it gets good enough compared to the best GBM that you found. And part of the reason for doing it that way is because actuaries tend to be a little bit conservative. They value having a model that they fully understand and it doesn't get more transparent than a GLM. You can see what all the coefficients are and you can see exactly what it's doing. Sometimes there could be regulatory risk benefits from having a GLM model. And by that, I mean, with the Anti-Discrimination Act, uh, you are meant to base any discriminatory pricing based on protected classes to be based on actuarial or statistical data. That's broadly how the law would work. Please check the details uh, as you go through that process. And to justify the pricing older people differently to younger people, having a GLM uh, to back you up allows you to say, hey, this is exactly what the curve looks. We understand exactly what's going on and be able to demonstrate that to the anti-discrimination uh, regulators. However, there hasn't been any like uh, test cases that I've been aware of around black box models. So um, that's not to say that you can't meet the, the level of proof uh, that you need from having a black box model predict your figures. I will say with uh, neural networks that um, they're just not widely used yet, um, but we can talk about how things fit in there. 
Oh, and I've skipped over the stacking approach there as well. Um, the other way you would go is you could just fit the GLM and once again, fit the GBM, but instead fit it on top of the residuals rather than just on top of the raw data. And then uh, understand residuals. Once again, you would use that to tune the GLM. Here is how a uh, neural network could work with technical pricing. Uh, I wrote a notebook on that, which is published on Actrice Digital. So if you're interested in the detail behind that, feel free to check that out. The uh, idea would be that you would uh, use embeddings for uh, categorical variables, um, and then you use a multi-layer neural network, uh, which you can have multiple outputs for to jointly predict things like frequency, severity, and risk premium. And the opportunity with that over the GLM and GBM approach is that you could potentially bring in non-standard tabular information. Uh, so things like natural language descriptions or computer vision data, that could all be piped into one big neural network if you have like the um, appropriate natural language processing layers and um, uh, convolutional uh, vision layers. There's some barriers though to adoption uh, within the industry. Uh, one is that uh, firstly, it's not widely known. Uh, things take time to uh, for people to learn about and everyone's really busy. So perhaps uh, this cohort could be the trailblazers in that area. The second issue is that uh, often uh, standard feed forward neural networks don't do so well against the GBM in practice for tabular data. So there's been some work done in that space from uh, some research papers like uh, TabNet and like Transformer, uh, Tab Transformer as another example, uh, where they've tried to build more advanced architectures that will match the GBM uh, in the uh, performance, but the standard uh, neural networks just don't seem to uh, work so well. So you need something more advanced quite often. But I can see the, the opportunity there in terms of processing uh, natural language and computer vision. And in addition, it can help augment existing approaches as well. So Kaggle, the uh, data science competition platform, uh, we've seen some winning solutions which didn't just use the GBMs, they used uh, neural networks as well in an ensemble with like stacking or blending or some kind of ensemble of the G various GBM and neural network models. And that had the best performance for uh, out of sample data. So uh, one way you could do it is uh, how uh, a lot of uh, companies are doing it at the moment, but instead of just benchmarking it against one GBM, uh, you could benchmark it against an ensemble of GBMs and neural networks. So you could fit an ensemble uh, and get the performance metrics of that, and then manually tweak a G GLM until uh, the metrics are close to your ensembles. The other way would be uh, you could st uh, stack it as well. You fit a GLM, uh, you fit an ensemble on the residuals, and then you understand the residuals until uh, you tweak your GLM to be good enough. Another way um, that a few research papers have gone is that where you have a GLM, you could add a skip connection to the output and put in a, a neural network in between. Uh, you end up with a residual network, and that's like a GLM and a neural network together. So there's a few ways you can go from a technical perspective to potentially incorporate neural networks into a technical pricing workflow. So just in terms of fitting models to residuals, I mean, maybe that's something that the other guys have covered before, but I haven't really seen that before. How does that process give you kind of extra information or improve your predictions? So what you're trying to do is uh, you fit the GLM on your data and you go, okay, um, how does my predictions from the model compare to the observations? Uh, and that's the residuals. You then would fit another model to those residuals. And let's say uh, you fit an um, XGBoost GBM on, uh, on those residuals. You could then look at the variable importances there and go, oh, okay, um, there seems to be something there involving an interaction between uh, gender and age. Um, and then you go, okay, uh, maybe I'm missing something in my GLM for gender and age um, interactions. And then you explore that further potentially. Uh, alternatively, uh, you could also 
just leave that there and just have a blend, uh, like a stack model where you just go, okay, well, here's my GLM um, and um, here's this extra um, model on the residuals and the two together is my final model. Okay, so it's kind of like a, a catch-all in case you, you know, you miss some interactions between your covariates. It allows you to, you know, kind of capture those features and still move them forward, um, even if you don't fully maybe understand where the interaction is coming from or, yeah. Yes, that's right. Cool, thanks for that. Hey, Jackie. Yes. I was just wondering, um, in that architecture you showed before, like historically on Kaggle, you know, neural networks get their butt kicked by, you know, uh, boosted models. Yeah. But has there ever been any push into, uh, I assume this architecture was built by, you know, a person, but has there been any push into uh, the neural architecture search to see if there's, you know, more efficient uh, architectures for, you know, different pricing problems? I don't think there's been a lot of research for pricing specifically that's public. I can't really speak to that. Uh, the architecture that we see here with the embeddings um, and the feedforward uh, neural networks, uh, that was loosely inspired by uh, the Rossman uh, Kaggle competition where the winning solution used uh, embeddings and neural networks. Uh, the um, TabNet and the Tab Transformers uh, that I mentioned uh, uh, in that last dot point, um, there, that would be some general research that um, various parties did to find neural network architectures that do perform as well as GBMs. Um, so they benchmarked it against the GBMs and they found comparable performance. Uh, TabNet uh, is a Google published paper and I think, think uh, Tab Transformers, I can't remember who did that, um, but they did benchmark that against GBM and found it was competitive. Cool, thank you very much. So then um, the next problem where machine learning uh, could be valuable would be claims reserving. And the problem statement for claims reserving is that we want to predict the uh, ultimate claims cost of policies we've already sold and or exposure that has already been earned based on available information. So uh, traditionally, you might use a chain ladder for that. Some key attributes of this problem is that uh, explainability can be important because this goes into your financial accounts and um, it gets reviewed by lots of people. Having that uh, auditability is quite key. That means that triangle methods end up being quite common. But um, an area of research is around granular approaches, which looks at data at the claim level. And it's an active area of research to try neural networks. And certainly that's something that the uh, machine learning uh, in for reserving in uh, working party uh, has been looking on, uh, looking at recently. And there's two main categories of neural network models that are being uh, tested. One would be uh, tabular format style neural networks. So trying to frame that similar to that uh, technical pricing problem uh, before or uh, alternatively modeling things as time series. And the tabular approach uh, would be something like this, uh, where uh, you would have uh, the accident period, the development period, and the calendar period as features, and you just try to predict the claims paid. And then somehow uh, you're using that information to then project out the um, bottom half of your triangle. Um, a, uh, you can make this more sophisticated. Um, I wrote a paper on that. So feel free to check that out if you're really curious. Uh, but um, the gist of it would be to try to predict um, future periods in a tabular format. Uh, another um, direction that uh, some researchers have gone would be to uh, have a uh, time series based approach and uh, some of them have been based on RNNs and GRUs. Uh, this above architecture uh, is from a paper uh, titled uh, Deep Triangle by uh, Kevin Kuo. Uh, it uh, feeds in the history and some attributes about the claims information into a GRU, um, puts it through into a fully connected layer and uh, outputs jointly the paid and uh, claims outstanding. So some interesting um, research being done there. The key challenge to out overcome um, is probably that question around um, explainability and getting uh, your auditors um, comfortable uh, with the approach. 
some potential value from looking at claims development at that granular level, claim by claim, rather than uh, looking at these big pools of risk. You can discover things about your claims that you might not be able to see uh, from um, just aggregating into triangle. I'll pause here for questions. Just the question on that more granular approach. Yeah. Um, so is that like, for example, workers comp, say someone's hurt their back, are we looking at their, uh, you know, medical history, I guess? Is it more of a claims management approach or what, uh, what do you mean by that? It would be, medical history could be a piece of information, uh, but uh, also the claims history as well. You would be looking at um, how the payments have gone claim by claim, any other information or commentary about uh, the claim itself, and then somehow inferring um, the uh, ultimate cost of the claim. So similar to what uh, the claims estimators do um, when they put together the claims reserve, um, but in a, a machine learning um, um, granular statistical way. I see. So it's almost making like a claim reserver, I guess, as a... Yes. Okay. That's really interesting. Cool. Uh, and potentially you could also uh, do that at the policy level. So rather than um, uh, just, um, I would say quote unquote, just um, modeling the claims history, uh, you could go back to the policies and say, okay, you've got this exposure. Um, you've got this claims history so far. Um, what's the ultimate cost taking into consideration? All of that um, picture. I'm actually reading this paper, this deep triangle paper. So it's good that you brought it up. But I noticed, um, have you, are you, like, have you read it a little bit? I've read it a little bit, but I won't pretend to be the expert there. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. But I, I was just wondering, because I've asked a few people at it about work, but I, I suppose the biggest problem about it is that w when you go from a chain ladder approach or, you know, it, it's essentially just looking, it's normalizing for, you know, uh, the, you know, you're, well, not the chain ladder, but essentially you're normalizing for the exposure of claims, but it never looks at um, severity. And I suppose their argument was that since we know this model doesn't take into account any severity information, as an actuary, I can make manual adjustments to take that into account. So suppose, like you said, with this more black box model, it's harder to put in judgment if, you know, COVID comes around the corner because these models, you, you don't know what assumptions they're making and what assumptions they're not making. Yes, I agree. Uh, that's an, a key challenge with um, machine learning and black box style models uh, generally. Um, without the transparency, it's harder to make adjustments for uh, the business context that you know about. Uh, there can be things that you can do even with black box models to um, understand what's going on in terms of uh, uh, things like uh, variable importances, um, partial dependency plots for you know, your GBMs. Um, uh, you could, could potentially invent something like that for uh, these kinds of uh, uh, neural network models too. But uh, once again, that's an active area of research and I wouldn't say that we've got all the answers for that yet. Okay, interesting. Okay, cool. Thank you. Cool. Uh, and then I'll just uh, give a brief overview of some of the other insurance applications. And I'd say that some of these aren't necessarily like uh, insurance industry specific, but just general industry applications that I've seen uh, around. Uh, one was that um, I have um, seen an article that talked about how uh, Ping An, um, one of the biggest insurers in, um, in China, um, has been using image recognition uh, of car accidents to help assess claims. So, you know, you smash your car, uh, oh, you just take a photo of it. And uh, based on that, you'll go into an image recognition algorithm, which will tell you how bad it is, um, or at least tell, sorry, tell the business how bad it is. Uh, from the sales side, uh, retention and conversion, uh, there's uh, opportunities to use uh, analytics there to uh, optimize sales. Uh, this tends to be quite easy to put into a tabular uh, data format. And so um, quite often that's going to use GLMs and GBMs. 
Um, but just like with the technical pricing discussion before, you can find that neural networks might also have value in specific contexts um, within an ensemble or perhaps even standalone, depending on how, how the metrics fall out. There's certainly no harm in um, trying uh, things out there. Uh, I've uh, seen how um, some people are starting to use uh, the Facebook um, profit package uh, to forecast time series. Uh, that um, isn't just um, neural networks. I think it also has like Arimas and uh, other model types in there, uh, but um, uh, using that to forecast your sales uh, or um, other things. Uh, there's also um, things you can do with freeform text and natural language uh, generally. Uh, I've um, had a situation where I had to review some um, descriptions of uh, the uh, nature of uh, the business that um, that's being carried out. So this is for business insurance. Um, people are selecting their industry code um, from this massive dropdown. Um, and then the in uh, words, they also describe what they do uh, within, uh, well, in practice. And uh, the problem there would be, uh, can we validate the free form descriptions against the industry code that they've selected? Uh, so for that, um, I did find that word to VEC uh, to GBM led to some really interesting results. Uh, and uh, this was like many years ago. So you can possibly do better than that with things like transformers and things like that, or more fancy things. Uh, with uh, service inquiries, uh, there's definitely a wealth of information there uh, with uh, automated transcriptions for calls now, as well as uh, you know, your big um, uh, volume of emails. So potentially you could draw some kind of insights using natural language there. Um, I um, don't uh, exactly know uh, what those opportunities might be within the organizations you work for, um, but whenever there is a large volume of data, there's usually opportunities to improve your business outcomes by data mining that. So um, this was uh, just meant to be some, uh, I guess, highlights of things I've spotted within the industry. Uh, any questions about these examples? I suppose I'll ask one more. Um, no. uh, I guess um, my biggest concern about these neural networks is, you know, the lack of adoption from the industry. Like there's going to be a lot of pushback from, you know, people who claim that they're not understandable or, you know, which they aren't. Uh, do you, I suppose my question is, what do you think would be the way that they get adopted in the industry? Is it to change, is it to try push APRA to change the legislature through showing how good our results get? Or is it more to work towards a more understandable model? Uh, I suppose, especially in the context of uh, loss reserving. Sure. Uh, so Firstly, I'd say that, um, well, yes, in loss reserving, um, the view is probably likely to be more conservative, um, but with all the other areas, I'd say that even within, like, within the industry, there's definitely a lot of supporters of innovation. So um, I wouldn't um, say that there's always going to be pushback uh, on using neural networks. Um, there might actually be some support uh, around um, interest in seeing how, what neural networks can do. Uh, within um, the more conservative sort of areas, uh, particularly claims reserving, uh, I think uh, there's no specific rule saying you can't use black box models. Um, so the uh, bar barrier to overcome is more to prove that these approaches are um, better for your particular use case. Uh, to uh, work that through, um, test and uh, make sure that things are robust uh, and perhaps even just running it in parallel with uh, your traditional approaches for a while and um, seeing uh, how the out of um, time, out of sample performance is and managing stakeholder expectations. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, I, guess, I guess the other thing I've heard a lot of is 
that these traditional models are, you know, good enough, I guess, that a lot of people say, you know, they're not the most accurate models, but in terms of this loss reserving, it's okay that they get within a realm of error plus the actual adjustments. Yeah, I have heard that sometimes too. Uh, but my comment to that is, shouldn't we be aspiring to be better? Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, um, we can make do with good enough, but there's definitely like a competitive advantage to organizations that do better. Uh, if you have a better technical pricing model than your competitors and you're operating in a market where that matters, then um, you'll be able to select a better risk and uh, your competitors will do a little bit worse and you'll end up um, ahead. Uh, if you have a slightly better um, claims reserving model, you can get on top of adverse trends um, quicker than your competitors who might be using a traditional approach. Uh, because you've got that granular insight, you'll be like, ha, huh, something interesting is happening with these claims. Um, Cause I can see that the mix is changing and that's influencing the outcomes here. Something's not going quite right. And then you can make the right decisions earlier. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I can see that uh, there are organizations that support um, innovation um, may end up having better financial outcomes. That's how I would justify it to your stakeholders as well. Okay. Cool, thank you. No worries. So um, we've reached the end of the content and um, I'll just leave some um, thoughts there. Uh, one is that um, within YDOG, we've collected a lot of the technical materials that um, we've written over the years and we've uploaded that into a book, which is freely available, free and open source. Um, so uh, the link is up on screen, um, feel free to check that out. Uh, the Machine Learning in Reserving Working Party has a blog with a lot of content, um, introductory materials, as well as really advanced um, research uh, level materials. Uh, so uh, once again, feel free to check that out. And uh, if you're interested to um, participate in YDOG activities, please um, contact me over email or LinkedIn. I'm quite happy to have uh, more volunteers and uh, do more things for our profession. Handing it back to Pat. Oh, I guess everyone can can give you a round of applause for that fantastic talk. Thank you, guys. Any students in the room for, for a final question or online? Is with more traditional models like GLMs and things, one problem that I well not problem but yeah I guess it's a problem that I've seen is that say we're you know insuring Amy or we're doing you know uh, actuarial work for Amy. And also we're doing actual work for, I don't know, Suncorp, right? Um, what I see a lot of modern models do is that they don't leverage both of those information, both of those sources of information to make predictions for each other. Because if they're in the same line, I guess the trends in Amy would have some information or some benefit in predicting, you know, Suncorp as well. Um, and has there been any work with neural networks to be able to leverage that type of information? I know, you know, there's transfer learning with words where you train it on a general problem. Patrick was explaining this to me the other day, but where you leverage a general problem and kind of use that information across the board. Uh, so uh, remind me again, like, uh, are Amy and Suncorp um, under the same owner? Oh, um, I, I was assuming they weren't. Okay, so uh, how would you be able to have access to both of the information? Sorry, this just could try to understand what you're talking about. Oh, let's say you're an actuarial consultant that, you know, does the books for both uh, Suncorp and Amy. Oh, I see. Um, I find that um, if you're working with different companies, uh, each of the companies will want you to keep your data confidential as a consultant. So uh, you uh, would be explicitly instructed to not... Um, allow other companies to leverage your data, uh, that data. Um, so you'd have to uh, basically pretend you didn't know anything about the Amy book when you did the Suncorp book and vice versa as a consultant. Um, that obviously limits the opportunities to do transfer learning and stuff like that. 
uh, if you were um, able to uh, have the information shared between uh, two different, um, let's say, products or brands within a larger company, uh, then um, certainly there's opportunities to just collect your information into one big data set and train a machine learning model of that. You don't necessarily need to do transfer learning here. Uh, you could just um, stack your data sets into one big table and go, oh, well, brand A has some cars, brand B has some cars. What's the predicted cost? Yeah, right. Cool. OK. Uh, our uh, unnamed Bernard in the chat has mentioned that Amy is actually under Suncorp. Uh, oh, okay. Which is news to me. But, uh, and I guess on the idea of uh, sharing data between different insurance companies, uh, perhaps uh, that can be part of, I'm hoping that I'll make such great friends in this course that they'll go out and then send me back data sets of interesting <laughs> things in the future and we can do something interesting like that. Yeah. It might be part of the final grade, you know, a promise to send me data. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. There, unless there's any final question, we should probably, you know, well, maybe we'll, we'll thank you one more time. And, and, um, and it's great that you could come and talk to us about all these fascinating topics. Thank you again. <laughs> no worries. It's an area I'm really passionate about. So thanks for having me. All right. All right.